Check, check, one, two, check, one, two, check, one, two. How's it going, everybody? This is the live Instagram q and I'm gonna be answering questions live on the air. Hope you enjoy. Uh, first question, how many gigs have you had in the year 2018? I definitely have averaged about one or two gigs live per week. I guess that's the average, so E flat 11. Great. Hey, Mr. Neely, what should I do as a left-handed bass player thinking about playing double bass? Um, the big advice I've always heard about that is to just learn how to play right-handed on double bass because there are no left-handed double bass players that play left-handed. They don't make instruments that way, and you can't set up a right-handed instrument left-handed because of the sound post in the instrument. If you do that, there's this like little post in the inside of double bass that like keeps the top from caving in from all of the pressure of the strings pressing down. If you string an upright bass left-handed, the upright bass could just collapse in on itself. Favorite bass line? Um, I'm always partial to Stevie Wonder's uh, For Once in My Life, the bass line that James Jameson played on For Once in My Life. It's, it's a really cool bass line. That and, I don't know, the chicken. The chicken is always fun to play. <laughs> What's your favorite dinosaur? Oh my God, it's been so long. I, I just like saying Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, that's just a fun, fun dinosaur to say, so maybe I'll just say that. You know, I might be a basic bitch and say Velociraptor, too. Um, but yeah, those are some of my favorite dinosaurs. Favorite Bill Evans song? Um, I'm partial to how he plays the Peacocks. The Peacocks is a beautiful song, and it's on his album, You Must Believe in Spring, which is probably my favorite Bill Evans album. Great stuff. Bill Evans, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piano player. Do you play the bass with the pick? So I occasionally do, I don't do it that often, mainly because it's kind of hard to play bass with a pick to the same degree of faculty that I can play bass with like my fingers. I don't play bass with a pick that often, but I think anybody who wants to play bass with a pick should. Any tips, advice for combining genres together effectively? So I don't really think about combining genres. I think that's a term that a lot of people kind of throw out there just to say like, oh, what if we combine symphonic power metal with jazz or something like that? I think about combining individual elements, like maybe a clean guitar sound or like a clarinet trio or maybe a dubstep wub wub, which I cannot like get over. I love dubstep wub wub. And I interviewed Charlie Rosen, who's a great, fantastic arranger. And when I interviewed him, um, he was saying that different elements fill the same roles in different genres. So if you're aware of the role of a particular element in a genre, like upright bass and a walking bass line fits a particular role in jazz music that, you know, maybe a syncopated funky line fits on electric bass, fits in another style of music, and then maybe like an acid syncopated line fits in like techno. You know, they fill similar roles and you have to understand how they fill those roles in those genres. Don't worry about like picking genres broad stroke. That is like not, I don't think, too useful. At least for me personally, maybe it is for other people. Maybe it might be nice to envision like, what if Frank Zappa met Zakir Hussein met uh, Bartok. That'd be awesome, I'd love that. But in order to actually do that, you have to pick apart the actual individual elements, individual elements that make Frank Zappa, Frank Zappa, Zakir Hussein, Zakir Hussein, and Bartok, Bartok. In your scene, is it okay to fart on stage while performing? It's not okay. I have done that before, to everybody's chagrin and uh, I'll probably do it again. I wrote a song that the Metropole Orchestra played here in the Netherlands, How to Not Suck at Mew. Uh, the Metropole Orchestra is awesome. That's congratulations. I love the fact that you got the Metropole Orchestra to play something of yours. Um, that was always kind of a dream of mine to get the Metropole Orchestra to play some charts of mine. They do this like workshop. I'm not sure if they're still doing it anymore, but the Metropole Orchestra, if anybody doesn't know, is this, I guess it's a contemporary music orchestra in the Netherlands that do really, really amazing jobs of interpreting uh, not only like weird jazz, but also like pop music and rock music. Steve Vai recorded with the Metropole Orchestra and they're great because they really understand the rhythmic nuance of contemporary styles of music in ways that other orchestras just don't. And that's something that I talked about in my video, how and why classical musicians feel rhythm differently. Uh, there's just such a different rhythmic language with most classical orchestras and the Metropole Orchestra for whatever reason has trained in a way that lets them really, really lock in with a rhythm section on a drummer and it's pretty amazing. Yeah, the Metropole Orchestra is great, so that's awesome, congrats. Bass? Bass. Who was your private instructor at Berkeley? So I had several. My private bass teacher was Dave Buda and we vibed really, really well. I love his bass playing and I loved his teaching. He really got kind of got me into thinking about playing bass at a higher level than where I was beforehand. My rhythm has always been my 
weak spot, I think. I don't feel like I really lock in with people as much as I would like to. And I learned that. I learned that from Dave Puda, is that my rhythm is really my weak spot. My private jazz composition instructor at Berkeley was Greg Hopkins, who I mentioned this in my Whiplash review. Greg Hopkins um, used to play with the Buddy Rich Orchestra and used to arrange for the Buddy Rich Orchestra. And he is a mother of an arranger, and he is such an exciting, like, person, inspiring person to be around. Greg Hopkins was f absolutely fantastic. I love Greg Hopkins. Do you listen to Blink-182? I have to admit, I was much more of a Green Day fan in terms of my pop-punk preferences when I was a child, when I was a youngin, uh, but I really do enjoy Blink-182. One of the things that was super fashionable when I was starting to learn how to play bass is people bashing Mark Hoppus of Blink-182. It was considered like, this is the worst bass player ever. How dare he? And I never quite understood the hate for Mark Hoppus. And then it became Pete Wentz of Fall Out Boy. I, I think Fall Out Boy. Pete Wentz was the name of the guy. Anyway, there, it was always, there's like a bass player that it was fashionable to hate on. I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't think that there are bass players that people just really hate or love to hate. Um, never quite understood that. L shut down survival strategies. Move to Queens. How to count septuplets better. I kind of borrowed this from Sean Crowder. You count to four by counting one and, two and, three and, four and, but then you don't count the and of the four. So it'd be one and, two and, three and, four. 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 One. And that way you're always thinking of on beats and off beats, even within the septuplets, there's always a downbeat, a one, or an off beat, an and, except the last beat, the four, is just an on beat. So that way I think is really useful for thinking of odd tuplets. Opinions on progressive sounds. So the use of unique effects and sounds in music. So I think the history of music in terms of people's preferences on musical style is very much predicated on technological development of musical equipment, and with new musical equipment comes new musical sounds. I think it's a necessary thing to experiment with different sounds, but not every new sound is going to be good, and not every new sound is going to become popular. It's just because you're experimenting with new things, eventually you might run into something that's really cool and really works, for whatever musical reason, for whatever cultural reason. I think it's important. I think it's important. When will the lick finally die? When will there be peace? Uh, I don't think it will die the same way that other memes will die. Um, I think people will get very tired of it, but at the same time, it's become such a calling card for being a jazz musician, especially among high school students and younger people, that it's kind of like the ultimate shibboleth. It's the ultimate thing of saying, I, I am one of you, I am one of you. Um, and it's not a mainstream meme. That's why it won't die until it becomes normie, officially normie. It's my official diagnosis as a musical memeologist. The lick will not die until it is on the front page of Reddit. Then it will die. Is eighth note triplets in nine eight ethical? I love that. Ah, uh, um, yeah, you could do it. You could do it. I've experimented with that sort of thing, um, like triplets, quarter note triplets in seven eight. That's a weird groove. I've experimented with that a couple times. You know, normally when you're dealing with tuplets, you're thinking about a more regular meter, but now you're dealing with tuplets on top of an odd time signature. This kind of got cut off. Do you think the life choices of a musician should be considered by the public when appreciating their art? I'm assuming is that the end of that. Uh, yeah, yes, and no. Um, the questionable moral decisions of artists goes back many, many, many centuries. I think of Carlo Gisualdo, who is a fantastically brilliant composer and also incredibly rich person in the 17th century, who murdered his wife and basically got away with it. The music sounds amazing and incredible and you can appreciate the music without knowing the backstory of Gisualdo. And in fact, it actually kind of helps understand the music a little bit more because the music is very strange and weird and so it's kind of nice to have that narrative understanding of the composer attached to the music that you're listening to. It also, it helps to have distance and time between when you're listening to the artist and when they did the crazy, terrible things that they did. Um, because I guarantee you, a hundred years from now, nobody is really gonna care that Woody Allen married his, like, stepdaughter or whatever. If his movies are still being watched and still being appreciated. Um, now it feels weird and icky, but 100 years from now, that's not really gonna be a big of, as big of a deal, I think. <laughs>
Jingle all the way Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh